This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. If you live in the United States, you already know who likes to talk about freedom and liberty the most. In the national contest over who gets to represent what values, the Republican Party, and conservatives in general, have monopolized the idea that their politics are the politics of freedom. Leave it to the left to kill our liberty in its fight for equality. We on the right, we stand for our hard-earned freedom. Unfortunately for the right, that couldn't be further from the truth. In this episode, we're going to cover a deeply left-wing idea. Freedom. We'll look at its history as a political concept and how what constitutes freedom, and who gets to claim it as their own, has been perverted in only very recent history. But before we get to that, we need to start with a brief overview of the left and the right as political families. If you're new to politics, you've probably come across statements like these. The left strive for an equal society and believe that the state should play a substantial role in people's lives. The right believe that a level of social inequality is inevitable and think that the government should have a limited role in people's lives and business. This is, as the right believes, that preserving personal freedom should be the government's main goal and should not impose too many rules on people's lives. It's pretty common for introductory political classes and videos to differentiate the left and the right by the two values that their discourse seems to essentialize, equality and freedom, and then to pit these two values against each other to explain the conflict of politics. It's all very simple when people are just disagreeing over which value they prefer. What's hiding behind this quick and easy distinction, though, is a rich history of both freedom and equality as leftist political values and the real conflict that animates politics. You probably already intuitively understand that this dichotomy between freedom and equality is just wrong. Conservatives have always been the party of lock her up, private prisons, increasing the police budget, and the death penalty. They're the party of who isn't allowed to get married, what women aren't allowed to do with their own bodies, who isn't allowed to vote, who's allowed in, and who isn't allowed to exist. For all their virtue signaling, freedom doesn't seem to guide their politics all that much. So, what's going on here? Where does that disconnect come from? To figure that out, let's explore a history of the left and the right and the role freedom has played in that history. The use of the terms left and right to designate political families originates with the French Revolution. Back in the late 18th century, France revolted against its monarchy, and when it came time to decide what role the king would play in French society, those who supported the old regime sat on the right side of the National Assembly, and those who supported the revolution and the new republic sat on the left. Conservatives on the right, progressives on the left. Centuries later, as democratic political systems in France and elsewhere became more defined, they borrowed this imprecise terminology to draw rough lines between the conservatives and the progressives who came to represent the core ideas of these two groups. Hierarchy on the right, emancipation on the left. This is the origin of the modern left and right, but it is also a stopping point of a longer history of freedom as a political value. And that history goes much farther back, at least to Mesopotamia, the first Hebrews, and ultimately ancient Greece and Rome, where the word that would become liberty was first used as an antonym to slavery. To be free was to not be a slave. This original definition formed the basis of some of the first formalized political debates for which we have existing records. In other words, freedom transformed from an abstract concept to a political one. And at the core of this transformation were debates animated by two questions. Who gets to be free? And what does that mean? A few answers begin to emerge. For Aristotle, a founding figure in the long history of political theory, freedom has many parts. In democracies specifically, freedom is both one, ruling and being ruled in turn, and two, the ability to live as one wishes without interference from others. These map quite cleanly to the way we still conceptualize freedom today, in negative and positive terms. Negative freedom usually takes the form of freedom from, as in freedom from obstacles or freedom from coercion. Positive freedoms are freedoms that can be formulated in freedom to statements, like freedom to act upon my free will. This distinction is relatively muddy, and many things can be formulated as one or the other more or less convincingly, but they make up the basis of political debates over freedom. 
On his end, Aristotle chose to formulate these freedoms in a political context by making negative freedom, freedom from coercion, tangible with his notion of equal and alternating rule, and positive freedom, freedom too, by ensuring one's ability to live as they please. For these conditions to be freedom, the very basis of a democratic society according to Aristotle, it is crucial that people must be equal in their political power. This is the variable that distinguishes democracies from other systems of government. Specifically, democracy is a system of popular sovereignty, in direct contradiction with a society where the more prosperous, the wealthy, can utilize their wealth as political power. Without a base level of equality in power, it is not a democracy. Aristotle argues this by saying that if no one has more power over others to a greater degree than anyone else does, no one is becoming a metaphorical slave to another. Remember that this question of slavery is incredibly central to early politics and the very meaning of liberty. With this theory of freedom then, Aristotle reassures the people of ancient Greece that simply by creating a political organization, so long as it is democratic and equal, the Greeks have not made themselves slaves to their fellow citizens. On the contrary, government in this sense is emancipatory, not enslaving. Of course, this freedom and equality only very narrowly applied to citizens of democratic city-states, typically meaning non-enslaved men and hardly anyone else. Nonetheless, ancient Greek city-states did adopt these theories of freedom. Athens is perhaps the most famous example of this, where over time the average citizen, which to be clear, still exclusively meant non-enslaved men, gained more and more control over their politics and therefore their lives. Athenians wrenched freedom from the hands of the elite, who made no effort to hide their disdain for this government by the poor, prompting at least one pro-democracy Athenian to declare that all men are created equal, and it is only the government that recognizes this truth that can guarantee freedom. This is the first attack on the false dichotomy between freedom and equality, all the way back in 300 BC. For democratic freedom to be realized, as Aristotle clearly states and the proper function of Athens and democracies demonstrated, there is a base conception of equality that must be ensured. Without it, freedom only applies to the fortunate, or not at all. But Aristotle doesn't stop there. He substantiates these relatively fungible concepts with a concrete example of freedom, leisure. One of the great tests of liberty is to be free to engage in leisurely activities, activities that bring pleasure, happiness, and are distinct from work, to have the freedom to do things for their own sake. Aristotle separates this freedom from democratic freedom so he can justify his preferred form of government, aristocracy. But this split ultimately doesn't matter. Leisure has just become enshrined as one of the measures of liberty. Keep this in mind as freedom continues to evolve. And freedom does evolve. Around the world, different cultures define their own conceptions of freedom, often in very similar ways. For example, in Indonesia, political liberty was defined in much the same terms as in ancient Greece, an antonymic relationship to slavery. The story of freedom, at least in the West, gets picked up in the Renaissance, during which humanists broke with medieval traditions and returned to ancient Greek and Roman texts, like the works of Aristotle. These writings became course materials for students living during the time, and with that, the concept of political freedom was revived once again. The democratic ideal, when compared to the feudal tyranny most Europeans were living under, began to appeal to more and more of the general public, eventually materializing violently in the Atlantic revolutions. Brandished like revolutionary flags, the slogan Liberty, Equality, Fraternity of the French Revolution hardly goes unnoticed in this period. The idea that freedom meant breaking with the regime of monarchs, lords, and the oppression of the commoners was an all-too-natural idea for the revolutionary masses who were impoverished with little to no recourse to their own self-determination. This sentiment of people being owed liberty carried across the world in the American and Haitian revolutions, where liberty and equality went hand in hand. After all, how could the Haitian people ever be free if they were enslaved? How could they be free if they were dominated? How could they ever be free if they were not equal? The revolution proved that they too could enjoy liberty, and it arrived only once they acquired equal status. Around the world, revolutionary freedom was demanded and subsequently declared. Unsurprisingly, this frightened the elites. The period of terror that followed the French Revolution gave rise to an anti-democratic discourse that led to democratic repression, notably in the Napoleonic regime, 
liberalism and conservatism alike were developed or resurged and came to dominate political discourse, concluding that democracy was ultimately dangerous to freedom, not its most valid expression. Nominally, these debates focused on the protection of the rights of minorities, but in practice, the greatest animating fear for anti-democratic politicians was that democracy opened the door to economic redistribution. In their minds, curtailing democracy was a perfectly legitimate goal if it upheld the safety of the class system. For this to happen, freedom had to be reframed by early liberal thinkers. Away from its origin as self-governance in a society of political equals, freedom became individualized. Parroting the arguments that had upheld the monarchy for so long, conservatives began to argue that freedom was best preserved under a benevolent and disinterested ruler or laws that made economic domination invisible. In pseudo-democratic societies, this was achieved by delinking institutions from popular power, or by curtailing it outright with greater state violence. For this sentiment to be catalyzed in the US, Americans had to wait until the abolition of slavery and the Cold War. At the end of the Civil War, democratic disinterest reached its peak among the American elite. Faced with a newly liberated population of black Americans, the idea that freedom belonged to the masses was heavily resisted with a slew of anti-democratic policies intended to curtail the freedom of the formerly enslaved to self-government and self-sufficiency. In its place, economic self-interest became cloaked in the value of freedom. To be free was to be successful, to mind your own business, not to achieve political equality or break down structural impediments to your freedom with the power of the collective. That was no longer an acceptable definition of freedom. Although prominent American political figures like Eugene Debs and FDR, alongside massive social labor movements, resisted this definition of individualized freedom and market domination, the final nail in the coffin came with the Cold War. The Cold War pitted the supposedly free against the unfree world. And once that battle had been won by the neoliberal West, its vision of freedom came to dominate political language. Freedom became impossible to disentangle from capitalism. While it's conceptually tempting to see this as the victory of one form of freedom over another, that is not the case. Capitalism and freedom have a purely adversarial relationship. Despite constantly being told that the two terms are synonymous, a capitalist regime all but eliminates freedom in economic matters, and so by extension, in social affairs. Of course, defenders of this system will say this is not the case. After all, capitalism provides us daily with the freedom to make personal decisions as consumers. Not only is this form of freedom incredibly limited, the great majority of our economic system is demonstrably unfree for most people. We see this play out most clearly in the domain of work. While capitalism sells us the idea of workers as consumers, who get to select from a catalog of meaningless jobs for the way to spend the majority of their waking hours, the exact opposite is true. People are forced into jobs for wages that rarely ever justify their efforts, for hours they do not choose, and in conditions they can't improve. Sure, we're free to not take a job we don't like, but on the other side of that decision is an economy where everything essential has been privatized. Your home, your food, your water and electricity, the services that you need to live, like hospital care. Every part of your basic survival requires you to accept this bad deal. There's no freedom between the choice of work and death, and our capitalist system makes that clear. Work lifts us out of a poverty manufactured by a system where jobs are the entry ticket to bare survival, and any form of economic security is rare. Today, the majority of Americans can't scrape together $400 for an emergency expense, and when the average ambulance ride will cost you $800, you're in trouble before you even get to the hospital which will then heap on tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And once people are locked into the environment of wage labor, things hardly get better. Part of the contract of a job allows employers to set unreasonable standards for workers, surveil their employees, deny them basic necessities like bathroom breaks. Any deviation from this complete control comes with the threat of being thrown back into unemployment, with all the dangers to your life that entails. Although it is the defenders of this system who rally around freedom, they have no problem violating it once you enter into a contract you were coerced into in the first place. When individual freedoms are allowed to dominate collective and democratic freedoms, the only freedom that is actually protected is the freedom of the wealthy to persecute the worse off. 
And that's not where this ends. There are, of course, the many ways our supposed freedom as consumers is infringed upon by capitalism's natural monopolies who happily jack up prices on essentials like life-saving medication. But even that barely scratches the surface. As you'll recall from earlier in this episode, one of the tests of liberty for Aristotle was the ability to enjoy leisure time. Leisure, in a sense, is a form of freedom that distinguishes human liberty from coercion and constraint, notably in the domain of work. As you can expect from a system that places such dramatic constraints on your life and such an emphasis on work as capitalism, the place of leisure is greatly marginalized. Freedom is marginalized. Leisure is restricted to only a few days of the week, and only to the very most fortunate. Few are the people who have the energy after a day of hard work to enjoy music and poetry as Aristotle did, to read a good book, to exercise, to take pleasure in life. And when you do get the chance, it's usually to recharge for the upcoming week. Leisure does not have a central place in a capitalist system because its enjoyment alone does not drive profits. In a society where work takes up most of our waking hours, most of our energy, and work is the only means by which we can guarantee our security, leisure is a luxury. Freedom is a luxury. The reason I am this insistent on the harms to freedom a capitalist system produces is because there are better alternatives. Under socialist organizations of the economy, the economic coercion seen under capitalist regimes virtually disappears, and freedom takes its place. This is a product of the more complete understanding of freedom on the left. The leftist conception of freedom hinges on two things. First, the ability one has to make decisions free from coercion, which critically includes constraints like acute precarity, lack of resources, and economic coercion, unlike the limited conception of coercion as only coming from governments and individuals in the conservative definition. Second, as the history of the left-wing struggle for liberty demonstrates, freedom is also a product of democratic self-governance. Since a socialist economy is based on prioritizing the provision of food, water, shelter, and medicine for all, not blindly following the profit motive or depriving people of these basic needs, eliminating the great majority of resource constraints, and granting workers democratic control over the economy, it actually delivers on the promise of freedom. Without poverty and an undemocratic economy standing in your way, you are free to live out your life as you see fit. Liberty and freedom are left-wing ideals. No matter how hard the global neoliberal consensus tries to convince us otherwise, there is no hiding this simple fact. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. When I decided to make the shift from general interest stuff to more radical political content, I knew I ran the risk of sinking my channel and losing my ad revenue and sponsors. These days, it's pretty hard to get a sponsor on my videos. I have one reliable one, and they're great. But for the most part, I'm having to rely on the generous support of viewers like you. If you appreciate the work I'm doing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, as well as access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a great place to hang out, chat with other like-minded people, or learn about socialist theory in our book club. I'm also pretty active in the server, so you're always welcome to ping me to ask a question or just say hi. You can find my Patreon, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every video at patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.